This week, Canada approved a second rapid COVID-19 test for use in this country. The government now has orders in for close to 30 million of both the antigen tests and molecular tests made by Abbott Laboratories. They produce results in 15 minutes or less. According to the company, public health officials have said this technology is essential to beating the virus and recovering the economy. My next guest is an expert in viral testing protocols. Michael Minna is an epidemiologist from Harvard University. He joins us from Boston. Hi, Dr. Minna, nice to see you. Thanks for making some time. Happy to be here. Before I ask you some questions about the accuracy of these tests, I think it would be helpful uh, if for us and for our viewers if you explain the difference because one is an antigen test and then one is a molecular test. I know they're both, fa both fast, but they're not exactly the same, correct? That's exactly right. The, the, the antigen test actually looks for the proteins of the virus, the, the shapes of the virus. Think of it as, as a, a test. If the virus was a human, it might be looking for the nose or the eyes. Uh, whereas the, the molecular tests, like the PCR and the Abbott ID now is a different um, molecular test. They look for the genetic code of the virus. The, in the human, it's the DNA. In this virus, it's the RNA. And so they're looking for two uh, slightly different pieces of the virus. Is there a difference in the level of accuracy with each type of test? Well, so the, the, the accuracy is really based on what is your target. And so the, if you're looking for the RNA of the virus, uh, the molecular test will do that very well. Um, but what's different is the RNA doesn't necessarily, if you find RNA, it, it may not mean that the virus itself is there anymore. In the same way that a, a detective might go to a crime scene and find human DNA, there's no humans there anymore, uh, but the DNA will still be there. The same thing happens with this virus. So the molecular test can be very, very sensitive to detect that somebody is or was recently infected but it doesn't necessarily mean the person currently is infectious. Uh, on the other hand, the antigen test can be made very cheap. Uh, they can be very fast, but they do um, have a little bit of trouble in sensitivity. They don't necessarily have the exquisite sensitivity to detect cases as the PCR test, but where they, where they do have slightly better advantage is that when they turn positive, it, it usually means that the person is currently infectious and should definitely be isolated. So it give, they each give slightly different information. Okay, so I think there's a, a real world example for, for many of us who are trying to figure out how, how reliable these will be when they eventually arrive in Canada. In the White House, we know over the past few weeks, and prior to that even, they were using the, I think it's the ID now, as one of the tests uh, for, for figuring out if staffers have it. Or, and, and what we've seen is clearly that didn't prevent the virus from spreading within, within that environment. What does that tell us? It tells us that um, that, a, that really no single um, approach is perfect. Um, so what I would say about frequent testing, uh, that the, the White House has managed to go from March all the way to October without having any cases uh, uh, that really spread widely throughout the White House. And that was despite their complete failure to wear masks and social distance. And so that I attribute largely to the, to the rigorous testing protocol but if you're not wearing masks and you're not social distancing and all you're doing is testing, you're essentially playing a game of roulette. Uh, eventually, your odds are going to run out and you're going to have a case that gets through the testing protocol, maybe just a bad swab. Uh, for any number of reasons, the test might not be able to detect somebody. And, uh, and so what it really tells us is, A, that the, the fact they've gone so long without major outbreaks tells us that frequent testing can be very powerful to reduce risk, but does not get it anywhere close to zero. And so we have to maintain all of the other public health practices like masks and distancing when possible. What can you tell us about the kind of global procurement environment around these tests? Because, uh, you know, a big conversation in our country is they just got approved basically in the last few weeks here in Canada. Deals were just announced uh, by our regulator. Deals were just announced by the federal government for, you know, 8.5 million, let's say, of the antigen tests with an option for another 12 million beyond that. But we're trying to figure out, like, is, is this enough? Are we going to have trouble procuring others because they've already been approved for so long in the States? What's your sense? Yeah, well, we have a, there's a lot of companies that are going to start building them. Abbott was kind of the first to market, uh, at least in the United States, to get EUA approval. Uh, Roche Diagnostics is starting to get into this space as well. There's a company in South Korea called SD Biosensor. And a whole number of new companies are going to be entering into the space. And so we'll see a scale up, but, we, but at the moment, they are still going to be limited. 
Uh, these companies can't uh, immediately start building tens of millions of these a day, uh, as an example, and, and there's going to be a, a ramp up. And my expectation is they will become ubiquitous, meaning many, many people have access to them, but it's probably not going to be uh, really very ubiquitous until um, the first quarter of, of 2021, in my expectation. And, and finally, and you think that's okay? That applies to Canada as well. Just quick. I do. I think, of course, the U.S. Um, is probably going to put sometimes more money into these things just because the, the economy is large, there's more people here, things like that. And so there is this concern, you know, this back and forth, are, is the U.S. going to necessarily gobble up all of these yeah. tests? And I hope not. I think that there's a need, just like with vaccines, this is a, we're all, we're all in this together. And if, if Canada has major outbreaks and the U.S. doesn't, then that puts the U.S. at risk and vice versa. And so I do hope that the, the leaders of our respective countries and, and globally can come to some sort of uh, understanding that these are all going to be scarce resources once everyone starts using them, and we need to figure out how to distribute them appropriately across countries. And, and just before I let you go, Dr. Mena, what's the best use of these type of tests? Because we, we have a system here, whether it works sometimes or it doesn't, around diagnosing those, P diagnostic rather, the PCR tests. We have centers set up, et cetera, et cetera. But these, it would appear, would be best used in a different capacity. Well, one of the programs or, or efforts that I've been really pushing for based on the research that we do in my research laboratory is this idea of frequent testing. If we're testing people infrequently, meaning say, say everyone's getting a test once every two months, this virus um, spreads before people even have a chance to start having symptoms. So the majority of people who we detect through infrequent testing with, even with PCR, will be beyond their period of transmissibility by the time we find them. So the only way to catch people early in their infection and stop them from transmitting to others is to do frequent testing. So I think that when one really good approach and a good way to use these tests is not to just have uh, everyone use one of these tests once, but, but go to a city where outbreaks are really um, hitting hard and enroll 30% of that city to agree to use one of these every four days. And so you have the same people using it every four days. Maybe it's K through 12 schools. There's a lot of different ways to think about how they can be best used, but it's the frequent use of them. Uh, and because they can be accessible to people right there, you know, they brush their teeth and they use a, a rapid test, for example, um, that can be possible. And that would be an approach that becomes a very effective to, to weed people out and filter them out of the population um, before they have a chance to go on and spread to others. So I think that they're best used as a frequent uh, test. The other option, of course, is to use them uh, similar to how they have been used at the White House um, as a barrier to entry. If somebody's positive on a rapid test, they can't enter. If they're negative on a rapid test, then they still take all of the same precautions like masks and social distancing, for example, to go to a restaurant or go to school. Gotcha. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks for your uh, time and your expertise tonight. Really appreciate it, Dr. Minna. Absolutely. Happy My to be here. Michael Minna is an epidemiologist at Harvard University. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.